Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to be talking about meshes. So before we jump into the video, I would like to take a quick minute and thank the partners of the channel. The partners are the highest tier of support both on YouTube and Patreon. And they are Kaden Arslia, Gerboles Inc., Kyla, Super Awesome, and Wen Shang. I'd also like to thank all the other fine folks that appear on the screen here. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. If you'd like to support the channel and support my work, feel free to have a look at the YouTube membership, or if you prefer Patreon, you can check out patreon.com slash Travis So, meshes. What do we mean when we say mesh? Because a lot of times this can be confused with the terms that we are already using, like geometry, because typically a mesh contains geometry. And so what exactly is our definition of a mesh? In our case, a mesh is a collection of geometries combined with a model matrix. So a mesh is a singular object that is placed within the world that can have multiple sub-objects of geometry. And the reason for this is because you will have the ability in many model formats like OBJ, for example, to have lots of objects within that OBJ scene. And you will then be able to import those, but uh, you, you might not want them as individual objects within uh, the world. You might want to import them all as one usable object. And so the way that we are going to implement that in this engine is we are going to have uh, one mesh which has multiple geometries, each of which can have their own material assigned to them. And then uh, the mesh also contains the model matrix and eventually a transform, uh, more on that in a bit, uh, as to where that exists in the world. And so this is sort of the next uh, layer of, of data that we have to represent objects in the world. Now, I do want to point out that this video is part one of a mesh system. So we are actually going to wind up building an entire system around meshes and loading meshes and things like that. But we're not going to be able to cover that all in one video, nor do I want to cover it just yet. I want to get in the parts that we need now, and then we'll move on uh, to some other things, and then we'll eventually come back and finish off the mesh system. So this is part one of the mesh system. More to come on that uh, in the future. However, there are a couple of house cleaning items that I want to bring up. So the first thing that I've gone ahead and done is I've created some additional materials here because right now, uh, if we run, we can hit the T key and just swap out the materials that are on a given mesh. Um, and we don't really want to do it that way. We want to actually be swapping the entire material out uh, for that because that is more of a, um, a common operation, we'll say. I've gone ahead and created a cobblestone material under assets materials, and this just points to the correct maps. I also have a paving and a paving two material. So those just point to the correct map maps. And then of course we still have our test material here that is unchanged. So the next thing that we want to take a look at is a couple things in our renderer types. So the first thing we want to take a look at is a few changes to our resource types. So the first change that we want to take a look at is the material resource type. We've gone ahead and added a renderer frame number. And this is going to be synced to the renderer's current frame number so that we know that a material has been applied that frame because we don't want to actually apply a material more than once per frame because that actually causes issues with Vulkan and it's going to be an issue um, with the changes that we're making here. So we need to go ahead and fix that issue before it actually causes us problems. So what this will do is keep our descriptors to only be updated once because that's all you need to do uh, for a particular instance of a material, for example, is you only need to update that a maximum of one time per frame. So uh, what we're going to do is every time the material is actually updated or applied for a given frame, we go ahead and sync this frame number to the renderer's current frame number. And that will tell us that the that the material has already been updated this frame, we don't need to do it again. So we've gone ahead and added that there. And then the next thing that we've done is underneath our geometry structure, we've gone ahead and added a new structure for mesh. And this just has a geometry count and array of geometry pointers. So note the double pointer there. 
Uh, this is an array of geometry pointers, not an array of geometries. And a model matrix. And that is uh, basically all the updates to our resource types. We also have a update to our material system. So the first thing is, is our material, when we're setting it up or initializing it, we start off the render frame number at invalid ID, just to make sure that that absolutely will get the update as we expect. If we go a little bit further down to our destroy material, when we destroy it, we set that back to invalid ID, just in case we happen to reuse it for something. And that just makes sure that um, we're always having an invalid ID whenever the material is not in a valid state to actually be used. So just a couple small changes there. If we go to the render a front end, starting towards the top, the first thing that we're gonna do is we are actually going to edit the renderer draw frame. And initially what we were doing was all the way down here at the bottom of this function after everything had run successfully, we were actually performing the frame count update down here. We don't wanna do that anymore because there are certain circumstances where a frame has passed but maybe didn't actually make it all the way down to this point in code. But we still want to increment that frame number because uh, we might have applied a material there, but then didn't wind up rendering the actual frame or rendered part of the frame or something like that. So no matter what we do, we always want to update that frame number and that's stored in the back end. So um, we just do that the first thing before we do anything else uh, is we go ahead and increment that frame number. So next down here, we have a small change for the draw geometries. And what we do is so instead of what we had before, which was essentially just this check here, which basically looked at it and said, well, if the instance application failed for some reason, then we go ahead and just move on to the next frame. We don't actually wanna do that here. Uh, move on to the next geometry, rather. We don't wanna just do that here. We want to check a few other things. So uh, we've added a little bit more logic in here where we look at the renderer frame number and we say, if that is not synced, with the back end frame number, then we want to go ahead and attempt to apply this instance. Uh, if uh, the instance application is successful, then we want to go ahead and sync the frame number here. Otherwise, we'll warn about it and continue and try again on the next frame. So this is where that synchronization happens. And all of the rest of our application updates are actually gonna be in application.c. So we're going to start at the top of that file and sort of work our way down. So the first thing we're gonna need is DRay. And I'm putting this in the temporary section of our includes because this is a temporary solution. Obviously, once we have a mesh system, we're not going to need this DRA anymore. But for right now, uh, we're just going to use it for convenience sake. Within our application state, we actually have one more thing that's going to be added, which is a DRA of meshes. So that's in a sort of uh, temp directory. Before uh, we had just a pointer to our test geometry, and now this is going to be a D array of message, uh, meshes so that we can have uh, more than one of them at once. The other thing that's changed is our debug event because I've mentioned before, we don't wanna just be swapping out the textures. We actually should be swapping out the material. And so that's what we're gonna do now. And so our material names are happen to be the same thing as our old diffuse names. So we are still gonna keep that same logic. Um, all of this old name logic, this all stays exactly the same. It's just instead of dealing with textures now, we're going to be dealing with materials. So all we do is we get a pointer to the material, make sure it exists, and then go ahead and acquire the new material and warn about it if we did not acquire the new material and use the default if for some reason that failed and then release the old material. And that is it, right? Uh, we don't have to worry about all this texture getting and, and setting. Uh, all we have to do now is swap the material and it's a lot simpler for us to use. So in the application create, we have a few small changes in here as well. So past all the system 
setup. In our temp section, we are now initializing the app state meshes to be a D array created of mesh type. And now we have a mesh called cube mesh. And our cube mesh has a geometry count of one because for right now, we're only gonna use one geometry. We are going to K allocate a array of those geometries, which is just gonna be one. So we're gonna allocate enough space for a single mesh. And we're still going to read in our configuration, generate our tangents as expected. We're going to set the first geometry to the geometry that we acquire from that config. We will set the cube meshes model to mat for identity. And we'll go ahead and push this onto the app state meshes. We'll also go ahead and free up the config uh, for that. And now we're going to create a second cube doing the exact same thing. So we're gonna have everything basically underscore two. It's going to be the exact same, except it's going to be a little bit smaller. So it's gonna be five uh, by five by five. And then the position of it is going to be 10, zero, one. And so we're just gonna create a uh, translation, we're going to create a translation matrix for uh, the model for the second cube mesh. Go ahead and push that into the array as well and clean up the config from that. And that will then allow us to come down into our application run and make some modifications to this to make it a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more flexible. So our packet creation still, our packet creation still remains as it did before. We have our mesh count here, which is just our DRA length. If our mesh count is greater than zero, meaning yes, we have one, we are gonna go ahead and set up an array of packet geometries. Now, I do want to point this out, and I did put a note in here. Yes, I am fully aware of how crappy it is to create a new array on every frame. Um, it doesn't matter for now because it's completely temporary. So uh, sometimes when you're testing things, it's a little bit quicker to stand something like this up, performance be damned, right? Because we know that we're going to be having something that is much more robust than this. Uh, this is just to get things up and running. So we've put a note in there that, hey, this is a hack, this is crappy. Yes, I know it's crappy, uh, but we're putting it in here anyways just to get something up on the screen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna perform a small rotation on the first mesh. So uh, we go ahead and create a quaternion rotation. We create a rotation matrix from that quaternion, and then we multiply it against the current rotation matrix. And you'll note that this is different in that we do not have a static rotation uh, or angle anymore, right? This is calculated just as the delta time times 0 0.5 on every frame. And we just recalculate this every time. And by multiplying this against the current model, this rotation matrix, we are applying that rotation on every single iteration. So this effectively has the same exact effect but uh, instead of having to have a, you know, a, a hacky uh, sort of variable there that just gets updated um, and exists statically, this is a little bit closer to the proper way of doing it where we're updating the model matrix on every frame. And then uh, we go ahead and check if we have uh, more than one mesh, then we go ahead and we quote unquote, parent the second cube mesh to the first. So this is our first sort of exercise with a little bit of hierarchy. And what we do is we calculate the model matrix of the second mesh as a translation matrix multiplied by the model matrix of the first mesh. And by multiplying the local translation matrix of uh, what we're going to, where we're gonna place this cube in the scene, by taking the local and multiplying it by its parent, we get the world position or the model matrix for the child. And this will actually have an effect of parenting it. So this will also inherit the translation rotation scale of its parent by doing that. So this is sort of the first step for that. Next, we iterate all of the meshes and we add them to the packet's geometry collection. So this is uh, gonna be adding to that packet geometries uh, DRA that we, we went ahead and created before. So we iterate each mesh, and then within each mesh, we iterate the geometries. We create a new geometry render data, which takes in a geometry and a model. Now, theoretically, yes, we could technically just pass the geometry itself, but I don't wanna make our render process too aware of the geometry itself. 
it really, um, or, or I should say the mesh itself. The renderer shouldn't really care about a mesh. It really only cares about a geometry and a matrix to render that geometry at. So that is all we're gonna pass it, um, and we're gonna call that geometry render data. So for each one of these geometries, we're basically going to take a copy of the geometry, um, pointer to the geometry rather, and take a copy of the model matrix. We'll then push that onto the geometries array, and that will get uh, passed along in the packet to be rendered. So we also set our packet geometry count to the DRA length of geometries. And uh, we do this packet geometry count because we don't want the backend to have to rely on the DRA structure uh, because if we ever change that or do something different on the front end and it's not a DRA, uh, we don't want the renderer to then have to be refactored because of that. So that's why we have those separate things. So uh, that takes care of the case where if we have uh, more than uh, zero meshes, basically. If we have zero meshes, we just uh, say that uh, packet geometry equals zero and packet dot geometry count equals zero. We then have another little cleanup section down here just to clean up that packet geometries array to make sure it doesn't get leaked. Again, yes, I know this is crappy, but it's temporary. <laughs> so all of you guys out there, relax. The updates uh, to this system are going to be uh, much better than this. We're going to use some specific types of allocators to handle this stuff much more gracefully. So don't worry about it for now. Okay, so that is basically all of the updates. So let's go ahead and we're going to run a task and post build our shaders and we're going to clean and rebuild our project. And we'll go ahead and run. And we see now that we have our first cube that is rotating in space here. And we have our second cube, which is at an offset but rotating along with the parent because it is inheriting its rotation. So we can see that our sort of hierarchy system that we've set up here is working as expected. And if we come back here um, and have a look at where our lighting is, we can see that that also gets applied to the child object as well as it passes by. Let's actually switch to our lighting mode so we can see that a little bit more clearly. And we'll switch the texture on the um, the main mesh just so we can see that a little bit more clearly as well. So if we look here, we can see that the green light being applied and the red light being applied there on the back face. So it's a little bit hard to see because it's so close to this parent cube, but uh, we can see it right there. And then as it comes around this other corner, we'll see it appear right there. There it is. So um, the parenting works as expected. And we now have a mesh uh, sort of quote unquote system, or at least a structure rather, that we can build on top of uh, to start handling things. Uh, a little bit more like you would expect in a game engine. So next we're going to set up proper transforms uh, in the next video. So stay tuned for that. But that is gonna do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys are enjoying this series. I hope you're learning from it. And if you liked the video, please toss it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. Click the little bell icon there to get notifications as to when new videos on this or other series drops. And I will see you guys next time.